Thank you very much for coming out to our first day of issue ceremony for the Saul Bellow postage stamp. My name is Sean Hargadon. I'm the Strategic Communications Specialist for the Central Area of the Postal Service. We are very proud to hold this program at the University of Chicago, where Saul Bellow is well known. I would like to thank the University of Chicago for hosting this program, and special thanks to Rachel Rosenberg, Director of Communications for the University of Chicago Library, Sarah Patterson, Director of Communications for the Division of the Humanities, and Elizabeth Braun Rush, Executive Dir Director, Strategic Communications, Division of the Social Sciences, for their assistance in making this program happen today. So thank you. Thank you also to Josh Beck and David Geyer for setting the room up for today's program. And finally, uh, thank you to our speakers, who you'll all soon hear from, our honored guests, faculty, students, and stamp enthusiasts for joining us today. This is a wonderful turnout for this. What can you say about our honoree? Sal Bellow joins a distinguished list of authors and poets who are part of our Postal Service, Postal Service Literary Stamp Series. This includes John Steinbeck, Norrell, Zora Neale Hurston, Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, and Mark Twain, just to name a few. The stamp art features a pen and ink watercolor portrait of the novelist and the iconic L train of his adopted hometown of Chicago. We're pleased to offer the stamp and honor Saul Bellow, a great writer and a true historian of the American identity. I would like to introduce our first speaker this morning. Torsten Reimer is the university librarian and dean of the university library. Torsten joined the University of Chicago in April 2022. He's a leading, he is leading the process of developing and implementing a comprehensive strategic vision for the future of the library, the 10th largest academic library in the U.S., and the home of the Saul Bellow Papers. Please welcome Torsten Ryan. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you all for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, to unveil this stamp. It's my first stamp ceremony, and as I learned, some of our colleagues from the US Postal Services, it's also their first. So this is a really exciting moment. Saul Barrow came to this university initially as a student, uh, and later as a faculty member. He was teaching in the Committee on Social Thought from 1962 to 1993. Some of his best-known novels include The Adventures of Augie March, Herzog, Humboldt's Gift, Mr. Sumler's Planet, and Ravelstein. The novels, including some set in Chicago, made him a prominent citizen of the US and the wider world. Appreciating that others would be interested in his legacy in the future, he began giving his papers to the university library uh, starting in 1964. At the library, we ultimately acquired 256 boxes of letters, notebooks, typewritten drafts of novels, photographs, artwork, and other materials that now make up the Saul Bellow papers. And I would like to invite everyone who is interested to come to our Hannah Holborn Gray Special Collections Research Center to consult them. The library and special collections are open to everyone, not just to members of the university community. Looking at these items will allow you to delve into the life and writings of Saul Bellow and understand the role that he played in an extensive network of authors and civic leaders in his day. Perhaps one of his most famous sentences appears at the opening of the 1953 novel, The Adventures of Augie March, uh, when Augie the narrator declares, I'm an American, Chicago-born, Chicago, that somber city. And go at things as I have taught myself freestyle, and will make the record in my own way. First to knock, first admit it, sometimes an innocent knock, sometimes a not so innocent. Barrow, I think, shares some commonalities with his character Augie, but he also differs in important ways. While both lived in Chicago, Bella was born in Lachine, Quebec, arriving in Chicago as a nine year old in 1924 and becoming an American citizen in 1943. Augie takes a freestyle approach to life, and Bellow developed his own distinctive literary style, composed of a contrasting high and low culture set of elements. Critics describe the event of Augie Mars as picaresque and meandering in structure, but Bellow's writing process was definitely not directionless. He was a relentless editor of his own work, 
for finding character names, sentences across notebooks and multiple drafts, gradually achieving precisely the shape that he wanted. We can see this in his archival papers, observing in the evolution of drafts how he changes the name of a character, improves the structure of a sentence, and changes the point of view. Since we are here with representatives of the US Postal Service for the unveiling of a stamp, I think it's also important to point out that the Sorbello papers contain extensive correspondence. Letters in our archive include those between Bello and writers such as, and it's going to be a longer distinguished list, Samuel Beckett, Lillian Hellman, Delmore Schwartz, Allen Ginsberg, Arthur Miller, Cynthia Osig, Norman Naylor, Philip Roth, Joyce Carol Oates, and Dave Eggers. Bello also corresponded with political leaders and diplomats, including Ted Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Gerald Ford, Richard M. Daly, and Kofi Annan. Our archivist, Ashley Gosler, who is here, and uh, you might want to ask her some questions later, she was one of the first people to review the full collection of papers as she prepared them for use by researchers. And she remarked that she was especially fascinated to find correspondence between Bello and another vital figure in American literature, Ralph Ellison, literary critic and author of Invisible Man. Ralph, his wife Fanny, and Saul actually lived together in a house in Tivoli, New York, in the mid to late 1950s, as their letters illuminate. Bello's cultural impact continues today, as evidenced by the work of researchers, students, and artists who come to a library's archive for information and creative inspiration. Zachary Leader's two-volume biography of Bello, published in 2016 and 2019, drew heavily on the archival letters and drafts of Bello's writing to tell the story of Bello as an artist whose work did not flag later in life. Already famous and critically acclaimed at age 49, Bello went on to win a Pulitzer Prize, two additional National Book Awards, and a Nobel Prize for Literature. He published his final novel, Ravelstein, at the age 85. <coughs> Creative writing students at the University of Chicago come to a library to see the drafts of the novels that I mentioned, observing that even a writer as celebrated as Bello revises over and over again. Bello's work was also brought to the stage in 2019 when the Court Theatre here at the University of Chicago produced a theatrical adaptation of The Adventures of Ovi Marsh. We were delighted to work with the Court Theatre to mount an exhibition at the library that showcased treasures from our Saul Bello papers alongside materials generated by theatre artists working on the play's world premiere. And our associated web exhibit is still available online. As the release of the stamp brings renewed attention to Bello's work, we hope that those who are discovering Bello for the first time, or discovering him again, will come to the University of Chicago Library to learn more about Bello, his creative process, and the networks that he was part of. As you probably know, Bello entered into vigorous and even fierce debates in his time as a writer, a lecturer, and interviewee on subjects such as the role of the artist in contemporary American culture, and multiculturalism. In turn, his own role in arts and culture has been debated and repeatedly reassessed, not always without controversy. The University of Chicago encourages such debate, and we invite you all in the archives to come to your own conclusions about what Bello and his work meant to literary history in his time, and what they mean for all of us today. So with that invitation now extended, we'd really love to welcome you at the library. I'm now turning back to Sean, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Torsten. Our second speaker today is Gabriel Richardson Lear. She is the chair of the Committee on Social Thought, which was uh, Saul Bellow's interdisciplinary home at the University of Chicago. She is also a professor of philosophy at the university. Professor Lear works on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, her first book, Happy Lives and the Highest Good, an essay on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, is about the relationship between morally virtuous action and theoretical contemplation in the happiest life. Please welcome Professor Beer. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so as you heard, I'm the chair of the Committee on Social Thought, and I think this is just the most thrilling news that Saul Bellow 
our former colleague in the committee, is being commemorated on a U.S. stamp. So um, as Torsten told us before, Bellow joined the committee in 1963 and was a member for over 30 years, including a six-year stint as chairman in the 70s. Um, now, during that time, he won a Pulitzer Prize, National Book Awards, and the Nobel Prize, among many other honors. But I think that being put on a U.S. stamp is an honor of a different order. <laughs> it's an honor in which we, as Americans, hold up one of our fellow citizens as a facet in the prism of our ideals and aspirations, an occasion for pride and gratitude in an example of what we might be. And the fact that this immigrant, a child of Russian Jews, fleeing anti-Semitic violence and political persecution, was a faculty member of our university, is for me invigorating, a reminder that we should not give up on our ideals as an inclusive place of learning. So my colleague, just as a, you know, to put this in perspective, my colleague, Nora Titone, tells me that when Bellow's family moved to Chicago in 1924, 70% of Chicago residents were either foreign-born or the ch children of foreign-born parents. And that is something I think we should keep in mind um, as we are dealing with our you know, current influx of migrants. Um, but I'm here to talk about uh, Bellow's membership in the Committee on Social Thought. Now, I should say that um, he had left by the time I came here. I did meet him once um, with his last wife, Janice Bellow, at the home of Evelyn Neff, who was the widow um, of the founder and now namesake of the Committee on Social Thought, John U. Neff. But I didn't know him. But I've been talking to my colleagues who did know him and also looking in our folders of information, the sort of wonderful formal correspondence of an era of the university that really wasn't that long ago, and yet that's not the way, uh, that's not the way memos sound now. Um, anyway, it's been a lot of fun. So you might expect that um, Bella would have been a member of the English department or that he would have taught creative writing, but no, except for, as far as I can tell, except for a one-quarter undergraduate tutorial, he never taught an official creative writing course at the university. Instead, he taught in the Committee on Social Thought, which you might call an interdisciplinary department, but which might be better described as non-disciplinary, a department formed to serve as a counterweight to premature disciplinary specialization and dedicated to a broad conception of knowledge as attempts to answer questions that transcend disciplines. Above all, the committee was and is dedicated to reading, the practice of reading together. So you can see why such a place might have appealed to Bellow. A novelist, and maybe above all, an American novelist or an American immigrant novelist, would not want to be limited to teaching literature of a single national tradition, or even to be limited to teaching fiction. The Committee on Social Thought allowed him to teach whatever books he loved and wanted to talk with others about. He taught a series of seminars, mostly on European novelists, Proust, Joyce, Balzac, Shakespeare, well, that's not a novelist, but you get my point, but sometimes also on Nietzsche, Goethe, and Rousseau. He often co-taught seminars with committee colleagues, the great translator of Greek tragedy, David Green, and later the political philosopher, Alan Bloom. Now, it's a word about Bellow's interest in philosophy, which I think must be part of what was attractive to him in being in the Committee on Social Law, certainly the opportunity to teach with Alan Bloom. It seems to me that he was not especially interested in figuring out the details of how arguments worked. Um, although I think we should say, and this is something that we philosophers in the committee need to remember, is that the sort of precision that is exercised in an excellent metaphor is also a form of knowing, and one of which Bellow was a complete master. Um, but I think, my guess is, some of you all will know better than I, that what he was drawn to was the attempt by some great systematic philosophers to speak holistically about the world. 
And in the case of literature, too, Bella was interested in its ability to bring into play the blessed faculty of wonder and the authority of the imagination to range over the entire world, to leap towards the marvelous, as his colleague, the art historian Harold Rosenberg, called it. Now, it's wonderful to consider the interplay between what Bella was teaching and what he was writing. In 1964, the year Herzog was published, he taught Stendhal, Dostoevsky, Dickens, and a course called 20th Century Religious Novels. In the years immediately preceding the publication of Humboldt's Gift, he taught Don Quixote, War and Peace, Conrad, and Mark Twain. In 1977, when he won the Nobel Prize, he had been teaching seminars on Joyce's Ulysses and Madame Bovary. It's evident that Bellow was using his seminars to study more closely the novels that inspired his own picaresque, realist style. And it must have been thrilling for his students to read these authors through the eyes of a great novelist who was such a splendid heir to their tradition. So um, I've been trying to give some flavor of why I think Bellow might have I mean, he could have taught so many places why he might have been attracted to teaching in the Committee on Social Thought. But I think it's also worth pointing out why the Committee on Social Thought so much valued having him among their number. Um, I think that the Committee on Social Thought provides a distinctive model for how to integrate literary artists into the research university. Instead of being grouped exclusively with other artists and teaching only students who want to learn to write fiction, Bello ad advised dissertations and graded graduate student qualifying exams alongside political theorists, such as Hannah Arendt, sociologists, such as Edward Schills, historians, Francois Fure, and classicists, such as Jamie Redfield. Um, he was part of a milieu in which scholars of the traditional academic disciplines and literary artists are committed to thinking together in their diverse ways about questions of great significance. It's clear that Bellow adored the ethos of the committee. In all of his novels, his character's voraciousness for learning and big ideas exudes the multidisciplinary life of the committee. And his final novel, Ravelstein, is a love song to his colleague, Alan Bloom, and to their friendship. So just in parting, I'll say when I heard this news, I sent out an email to the colleagues and students of social thought um, saying, you know, can you believe what's just happened? And the response was immediate and overjoyed. And as one colleague, will, who shall remain nameless, said, now the committee has made it. So... <laughs> So it's a great occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lear. Our third speaker on the program this morning is David Welberry. Welberry is the Leroy T. and Margaret Deffenbaugh Carlson University Professor in the Department of Germanic Studies, as well as a member of the Committee on Social Thought and the founding director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on German Literature and Culture at the University of Chicago. His research, research interests converge on the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the age of Goethe and the age of idealism. Please welcome David Welby. Welby. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. It's an honor to be here. I, I do not speak as a scholar today. Bello does not belong to my specialties. I speak as a fan. I'm a devoted reader of Bello's, and it was a, a thrill for me to learn of the uh, stamp commemorating his contribution to American literature. So these are a fan's notes on Bello's writing. And as you'll see, I'm going to quote the same passage from Augie March, uh, Corson <laughs> quoted, and I can tell you it's being quoted all around the United States today. There's something about that opening of the novel that just uh, picks people up, and I'll get to that in a second. I think that to understand Bellow's literary achievement, it is useful to recall that his first two novels, Dangling Man from 1944, and the victim from 1947 
were cast in the mold of mid-century European existential malaise. The mood is bleak, and a dark past engulfs every possible future. Then, half a decade later, Bello found a new voice that carried him along toward the first of the three National Book Awards he would eventually receive. And here, as promised, is the opening of The Adventures, The Adventures of Augie March from 1953. I am an American, Chicago-born, Chicago, that somber city, and go at things as I have taught myself, freestyle, and will make the record in my own way. First to knock, first admitted, sometimes an innocent knock, sometimes not so innocent. Now what picks the reader up and transports her along in a whirlwind of verbal enthusiasm here is the self-affirmative, risk-taking, improvisational inventiveness of the whole business. This speaker sets out on what are called adventures, taking on what comes in his self-taught and, as he puts it, freestyle way, writing his own record, the very novel that we hold in our hands, his own record in his own way, the creation of a style, a unique and personal style. This is the sentence, these two sentences, this is a declaration of self-reliance, self-reliance in the full Emersonian sense. And it is meant to be felt as specifically and affirmatively American. That's the force of the first four words. And the throbbing heart of the America Augie March celebrates is Chicago, the stamp whose issuance occasions our gathering today acknowledges that fact. The American novel of the 20th century achieved its twin peaks of literary greatness in the work of two novelists whose characters, styles, and plots are animated by a particular genius Loki. With Faulkner, it's Yokna Patoafa County in Mississippi, with Bellow, it's Chicago in Illinois. Here's Charlie Citrine, the friend and counterpart of the deeply troubled poet von Humboldt Fleischer in Bellow's 1975 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Humboldt's Gift. I could feel the need to laugh, rising, mounting, always a sign that my weakness for the sensational, my American, Chicagoan, as well as personal craving for high stimuli, for incongruities and extremes, was aroused. That's it, exactly. Chicago, for Bello, is a zone of emotional, intellectual extremes and his writing leaps, often within the space of a single sentence, from one such extreme to the other. It is, as Augie March puts it, a somber city, but it flashes with explosions of the sensational. And all of this rests, all of this rests for Bellow in each of his novels on a flow of money. From Augie March to Ravelstein, Bellow's plots are carried by a stream of capital. His main protagonists tend to be in debt, but there always seems to be an uncle or a brother who's hit it big and from whom the economically hapless central character can get a loan. Moreover, in Bellow's Chicago, there is almost always an undertow, surprise, surprise, an undertow of corruption of corruption, but at the same time, and this holds across his entire oeuvre, so many of his characters evince intelligence, erudition, even, I would say, biblical depths of feeling. 
No modern American writer's books are as cluttered with references to literature, philosophy, art, and history as Bellow's novels are. Even Augie March kicks off his story with a reference to Heraclitus that comes right after the passage I quoted before. All this is part of the incongruities that he celebrates and draws energy from. This comes, I think, fully to the fore in Bellow's 1964 masterpiece, Herzog. What is the place of intellect, of mind, in the life of this protagonist. Here are the novel's opening sentences. If I'm out of my mind, it's all right with me, thought Moses Herzog. Some people thought he was cracked, and for a time he himself had doubted that he was all there. But now, though he still behaved oddly, he felt confident, cheerful, clairvoyant, and strong. He had fallen under a spell and was writing letters to everyone under the sun. In America, in Herzog's America, in our America, Bellows' America, mind is out of its mind. Herzog is a writer, a teacher, a sometimes professor, the author of a dissertation on political philosophy and a book entitled Romanticism and Christianity. Those are big topics. He's also out of cash. The Berkshire retreat he purchased with inherited money is infested with mice. His wife, Madeline, has run off with Valentin Gersbach, his neighbor and closest friend. Herzog's family name may be the German word for a royal rank, Herzog is Duke in German, but he's a Duke deposed financially and erotically. And the world, the political and cultural world around him is falling apart too. In a comic ecstasy of defeat, he composes missives to everyone, the president, dead philosophers, the butcher around the corner. Moses Herzog is brilliant and cracked all at once. Out of the dissonance, the dissonance so characteristic of Bellows Chicago, out of the dissonance arises laughter. And that signals to us that Bellow is not by choice, but by a Chicago-based necessity, Bellow is a comic writer. This comes most forcefully to the fore in his last genuine masterpiece, Humboldt's Gift, the story of the poet von Humboldt Fleischer and his devoted admirer, friend, and as it turns out, in a grand surprise at the end, his heir, Charlie Citrine. How American this almost zany plot, the impoverished poetic genius achieves a monetarily surabundant afterlife in what else? A movie script. <laughs> it reminds me of a line from a 1965 letter Bellow penned to his friend Stanley Burnshaw. If the controversy surrounding Herzog becomes too loud to bear, he wrote, and I'm quoting him now, I can always stuff my ears with cash. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean about the current of capital. <laughs> but today, especially today, we should remember that all is not comic in Bellow's world. The near zaniness of Humboldt's gift follows on Bellow's darkest work, a novel that has looked horror in the face and in the process lost an eye, Mr. Sandlin's Planet from 1970. And the Dean's December from 1982 oscillates between Hyde Park and a communist Romania, highlighting the deep and depressing similarities between the two locales without, however, blurring the differences. Perhaps the most important lesson that Bellow's work offers us today is the demonstration of how precarious this place called Chicago, the throbbing heart of his American democratic vision, really is. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Welder. Your educational roots are firmly planted in Chicago, where she graduated from Lindblom Technical High School, Roosevelt University, and the University of Chicago, earning her MBA in 1998. Ms. Akins has had a distinguished career in the Postal Service, beginning as a substitute clerk and advancing through the ranks to the position she currently holds now as manager of customer relations for the Illinois District 1. She facilitates collaboration between internal and external customers, provides business solutions, resolves complex customer issues across the geographic boundaries, and works closely with local congressional representatives and other key political stakeholders and local election officials. She has received numerous awards for her work. She's also earned her Lean Six Sigma Black Belt for improving various systems, processes, in the Postal Service. And service to her is her passion, and she lives it every day, public and privately. Please welcome Regina Athens. everyone and thank you so very much for the wonderful introduction Sean it's kind of interesting hearing about me from someone else <laughs> as Sean mentioned I am Regina Akins the Illinois one district manager of customer relations for the Postal Service and I am so very happy to be here today at the 34th literary art stamp honoring Sal Bello I'm very honored to be at this program since I am a proud graduate of the University of Chicago. Going to school here and being an alumni was a great accomplishment for me and one that I am so very proud of. Um, with that, I would like to um, move on and acknowledge and thank all of our speakers and honored guests, faculty, students, and others joining us here today. This is regarded as one of the greatest American authors of the 20th century. Salbello took on large themes in his novels, including the pressures of material culture, the role of the artist in society, and the nature of the American identity. Born in Quebec, Canada in 1915, Bello and his family later relocated to Chicago, where they became part of the city's immigrant Jewish community. Bello would ultimately remain in Chicago for the rest of his life and often set his work here. And this is one of the reasons why this is so very special when we can honor one of our own. We have heard today many stories about Saul Bello and his life and works and his legacy here at the university. He was recognized with numerous honors during his lifetime, including the National Book Awards, Pulitzer Prize, and in 1976, the Nobel Prize in Literature. And I quote, human understanding and subtle analysis of contemporary culture that are combined in his work. That's phenomenal. He also earned the National Medal of Arts, the highest award given to artists by the U.S. government, and the National Book Foundation's Lifetime Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters. And now, the Postal Service is pleased to add this impressive list of accomplishments with the presentation of this year's Literary Art Stamp honoring Saul Bello. I'd like the speakers to join me over uh, at the unveiling, please. that was unveiled here with the university. Uh, the three-ounce cell bell stamp is available online at USPS.com and at post offices nationwide. 
Also here at the program, you can also purchase it in the back, the first day of issue envelope of today's event, and the stamps themselves, and have it canceled with a special postmark for today to commemorate the event. Thank you all again. Enjoy the rest of your day.